In this week's episode, we sail further south into Bredore Lakes, deep into the heart of Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. We are looking for warmer weather, sandy beaches, and some palm trees to sit under. Well, maybe not palm trees, but our compass is definitely pointing us to warmer weather. We spend a few days in Baddock, Nova Scotia, and much to our delight, discovered some incredible and fascinating history about the man behind the ubiquitous device called the telephone. If only Alexander Graham Bell was here today, I wonder what he would think of the cell phone. Second day in Kelly's Cove and it's still super foggy. Actually, it's got more foggy. And, um, but we really want to get going, so we'll try it. There is a bridge um, in the channel that we have to go under, which will be really exciting. And we have to be really careful about the current that's going on here. Yeah, we left uh, Kelly's Cove 15 minutes ago and it's already disappeared into the fog. We got a little less than a mile of visibility and you can just hear the current. It's crazy. And uh, peak current today is forecasted to be four knots. And we have just a little bit of motor on. We're doing 4.8 over ground and uh, 3.6 through the water. So we're really, really moving. We kind of want to get further inland, away from the coastal effects, someplace where we can do laundry and get some groceries. And go kiteboarding. And maybe go kiteboarding for Judith, for sure. And uh, yeah, just make some forward progress. So, and I mean, the fog has its, it's pretty. I like it. In its own right. It's actually, it's exciting. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of cool. Because you can't see. It's mysterious. So we got the radar running today on the chart plotter. And so see a little bit of the land outline. We can see if boats are coming up. We got our AIS running. There's our speed over ground. Yeah, things look good. Just can't see what those things are. There it is, the bridge. So we're going through the middle, obviously. The really crazy thing is that they put lobster pods here exactly where you have to go through the bridge so we have to navigate around these lobster pods. It's really green here. There's so many birds. It's so alive here in Nova Scotia. The lighthouses are beautiful and the shore is green, so green, so beautiful. Baddock Bay uh, on our way into Baddock Harbor. Had a fantastic sail coming down the channel. We rode the current and the winds, timed the current just perfectly to perfection. We were averaging about six and a half knots all the way down here. It was freaking awesome. One of the best sails we've had. It's always good when you have uh, current and wind pushing you along. Cool. Gone over six months, almost seven months, very close to seven months of not utilizing a marina. Granted, we did use the public docks uh, around Newfoundland, uh, but I characterize those as slightly different than a marina. There's often, well, over the winter time, there were no services really. So no laundry, no showers, all that stuff was shut down at the public wharves. Anyway, just about there and we're much further south than we've ever been and this is pretty cool and we're pretty excited so now we officially feel like we're in Nova Scotia 
proper. I mean, Kelly's Cove was definitely Nova Scotia, but this feels like we're really here, so this is cool. Yeah, I'm pretty stoked. After six months of winter, it's still pretty cold, as you can tell by my attire, but uh, it's gonna warm up here pretty quick, and the days will get warmer, and we're excited about that. Much warmer than the temps that we were seeing checking in on uh, back in Newfoundland, so I think we made the right call. We're here in Baddock and it's really cool here, although it's raining. And still cold, June 5th. Um, we have a whole island where we can walk the dogs. We have a place where we can do laundry. It's an awesome, sweet little town. And Wes already started the dinghy with our dirty laundry so we can work something today. dirty laundry on the dinghy dock. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty convenient here because uh, right down the street is the marina and the dinghy dock. And so we can just hike up the hill, get a little exercise, come over to the laundromat. It's perfect. And now we go to an art artisan shop. <laughs> yeah, there's all, it's definitely a, like a tourist oriented community. There's all kinds of art shops and really cute it's really quaint beautiful yeah. green and after being six months in the wilderness it's a really nice change yeah. please use other door it's hard for us to realize today that in the early 1880s the telephone was considered a newfangled contraption Boy operators manned the switchboards in those days, and it was an adventure to be able to talk with friends or relatives on the other side of town. The telephone at last was filling a deep human need, the need of people separated from one another to talk with each other. <laughs> this is the museum of Alexander Graham. What? Graham Bell. Oh, I thought that I thought it's Graham Bell. Anyway, this guy invented the telephone and there's he happened to live in Bad Egg where we're at the moment and we're going to see how that all worked. Like in I don't even know the year, but we will learn that all if we go to the museum. Let's go. Alexander Graham Bell is widely known for inventing the telephone. On March 10th, 1876, the world's first sentence was clearly transmitted over the telephone. Mr. Watson, come here. I want to see you. But beyond the telephone, Bell was a meticulous inventor pushing the envelope with other inventions such as how to distill water from salt water. His concern over the plight of men stranded at sea led him to experiment with several ways to distill salt water into drinkable water. The devices range from solar stills to condensers. Bell also experimented with wireless communications, way ahead of his time, using light waves to transmit speech. Catching sun rays in his transmitter mirror, he reflected them some 400 meters across the road and into his laboratory receiver. Cloud and rain easily interrupted transmissions and the range of communication remained limited. Still, Bell considered it the greatest invention I have ever made, greater than the telephone. For Alexander Graham Bell, the telephone was only a small part of a lifelong pursuit of knowledge and invention. Bell was a noted teacher of the deaf. As a teacher, he helped deaf people bright the world between sound and silence. At a young age, a girl named Mabel Hubbard had lost her hearing due to illness. Mabel's parents selected Alexander Graham Bell to work with her to see if he could improve her impairment. Bell significantly furthered her education and independence by improving Mabel's communication abilities. Later, after marrying Bell in 1877, Mabel Hubbard became his loving partner and greatest champion. It was Bell's work with the hearing impaired that led him to an array of notable inventions. 
but he was also inspired by other events during his life to dream up other inventions to help his fellow man. Air and water captured his imagination and his ideas led him from transmitting sound and light, creating a treadle-powered music machine, to man-carrying kites, airplanes, and a record-setting hydrofoil boat. This is a story filled with family and friends. A beautiful family home is still privately owned by his descendants, which we were able to admire sailing by. Okay, another foggy day, but that's the last one tomorrow. This one. Oops, not using cars anymore here. Oh, look at this here. Let's go there. The souvenir shop. Yeah, last day here in Bedeck. It's actually kind of a bummer. I really like this place. I could stay here for a while, but it's the way it is in this life. You keep and moving. There are so many other cool places to see, so. What is this again? I think it, it says on the front. It oh. used to be the old customs inspection house or something. I saw it yesterday. Post office and customs house. Built in 1885. I love the green door. This yeah. is so cool. And there's a head. Yeah. Somebody's head. Somebody's head. A and head. a souvenir shop. Let's go and look. Hi. Hi. Oh really? This is cool. Wow. Pretty awesome one. Oh, a knot ball. A uh, monkey fist. Monkey fist? What is a monkey fist? That's the knot. Ah, I thought it's a nice ball for Flynn. A natural <laughs> one. And we're off to Point South. We're not entirely sure where we're going for the night. It is lobster season here, so we're keeping a good eye out for lobster pots. And for some reason, that mystifies me. Maybe uh, to snare unsuspecting sailboats such as ourselves. But the the buoys for the lobster pots are painted, sometimes painted uh, black and green. I don't, don't understand, it makes it really hard to see uh, unless you're in a high bridge looking down on the water. So, yeah, that's not a desirable color for us to keep an eye out for. I like the orange ones or the white ones, those are much easier to avoid. Just beautiful scenery. And back there, right back there is where Alexander Graham Bell lived. And this lake, this whole lake area is where he did a lot of experiments with uh, flight, the silver dart, which we saw in the museum yesterday. And um, I guess they, he and another guy built or designed the world's fastest aero boat. It's something like 71 kilometers per hour or 100 kilometers per hour or something like that through the water using hydrofoils, which is pretty cool because that's the technology that the race boats in the America's Cup now use. And to think that it was being used 110 years ago, <laughs> it was really shocking to me. That was something new on me. I had no idea that hydrofoils were even a uh, consideration back in 1909, 1908, 1907, 1910, somewhere around in there. And that's pretty cool. And it's right here, right behind me. It's where all that took place. And uh, I think a lot of the development was spurred on by uh, the war efforts in World War I. And um, they're trying to develop faster attack craft, submarine intercept, intercept craft, etc. cetera. Um, but I guess the project kind of petered out because the war ended and the navies no longer had a need for those craft. So anyway, pretty historical place. Uh, a lot of nautical history in the invention world. It's not just known for the telephone back here. It's known for the first airplane flight in Canada after the Kitty Hawk in America. And again, the um, really cool 
hydro plane boat thing that they created. It's kind of funky looking. It almost looks like a submarine with a bunch of really weird wings and struts down in the water. Must have been a thrill to watch back in those days. In any event, we're heading somewhere around that direction. Let's do it. Thank you so much for watching. We appreciate you stopping by and joining our adventure. Don't miss an episode and hit the subscribe button below. Also, don't forget to push the like button. If you would like to support our mission and the creation of these videos, skip the lines at Patreon and head over to our independent content creator support platform and become a Hackloot team member today. See you next week. Huh. Oh. Foggy dog.